Hey everyone, I am here today with both Molly and Jaeger. They are being extra naughty, so we'll see if we can get them to lay down. Hey bud. Okay, okay, okay. So today we are reading the Passage to Avalon. Um, it's okay for all ages. And I've got some fun voices for you today, so I'm pretty excited. Let me just get my treats set up here for the monsters. Right, there you go. Yes, Jaeger, you get some too. <clears throat> okay. The Passage to Avalon. Prologue. King Pomeroy of Grawl chewed his thumbnail as he peered out the window at the assembled commoners. The crowd looked calm, but the king was no fool. These days, a pleasant smile only served to distract from the knife inching towards your back. It took him and his men nearly a week to extinguish the flames of this little rebellion, but the king knew that underneath the order, underneath the calm, the embers of defiance still burned hot and could reignite with the slightest disturbance. Your Majesty, a voice said from behind. King Pomeroy spun. What is it now? Pardon, sir. Imperial emer Emissary Larkin has arrived, sire. The King's steward. There you go. Good girl. Good girl. The King's steward said, wringing his hands. The King straightened himself and took an unsteady breath. Well, don't keep him waiting. Send him in. The steward hurried away as King Pomeroy paced the room. How was it that the worst news always traveled quickest? The emperor certainly hadn't wasted any time sending one of the imperial goons to check on the state of things. King Pomeroy needed to convince this emissary that everything was under control here in Grawl, even if order hung by a thread. He peeked at the crowd several more times before the emissary appeared in the doorway. King Pomeroy, the emissary said, his voice oily smooth. So good to see you. Quit the pretense, Larkin, the king snapped. We both know why you're here, so let's get it over with. The emissary flashed a predatory grin as he followed the king out onto the balcony overlooking the crowd. Thousands of pairs of eyes looked up expectantly. My loyal subjects, the king addressed the crowd with a well-practiced smile. We are privileged to be joined this day by an imperial emissary. During his stay in Grawl, he is a representative of the divine emperor and should be treated with no less respect than we would give the emperor himself. The words tasted like bile in the king's mouth. Lowering himself to the emperor was one thing, but showing deference to this weasel in front of his own people set King Pomeroy's blood to boil. Citizens of Grawl, Emissary Larkin walked past the king to the edge of the balcony. I am pleased to hear that the missing eighth tax was at last returned, and the humility and reason have prevailed. The emperor was concerned. The emperor can go to the void, someone yelled from the crowd. A small knife zipped through the air and embedded itself in the balcony railing, not two yards to Larkin's right. The emissary turned to the king and raised an eyebrow. To the void, more people yelled as bottles, tools, and sharp objects flew at them from the crowd. The king was ready now and held up his hand, blocking the projectiles with an invisible shield of aether. He had enough power to stop the objects, but he wouldn't be able to forcibly calm a mob of thousands. How dare they rebel again? They couldn't win here. What did they have to gain by provoking the emperor's ire? Are these the Orderly and obedient subjects that I've heard so much about, Larkin motioned to the crowd. Or is there another crowd you wish to show me? What would you know of ruling a kingdom? The king demanded through gritted teeth. 
You tell the Emperor that my kingdom will be the paragon of imperial order within the week. Tell him yourself, Larkin said as he turned and left the balcony. Confused, the king followed the emissary with his eyes. His blood ran cold. Standing at the entrance to the balcony was the emperor himself. Before the king could drop to a knee, the emperor walked to the balcony's edge, held out his hand, and gestured downward. The entire congregation fell silent as they dropped to their knees, pressed down to the ground by the emperor's unrivaled power. Your eminence, I can explain. The king's words were cut short as he too fell to the ground, subdued as if he were no more than an aetherless peasant. King Pomeroy tried to push back with his own aether, but only felt his power drain away the moment he used it. The whole city stayed silent, forced to bow down before their emperor, forced to realize that their ruler would either have their obedience or he would take it. After what seemed like hours, the emperor released his hold, turned, and walked away without a word. Nobody dared move, not even the king. As you can probably tell, your majesty, Larkin returned to the king's side, leaning close to his ear. The emperor has just expended a significant amount of power to restore order to your kingdom, Strange things have been known to occur with such a spike of aether usage. Do let us know if you see something... odd, will you? It wasn't every day that Sam carried around a vial of barf-flavored powder in his pocket. But today wasn't any old day at Rock Valley Middle School. Today was the second Thursday of the month. For Sam, Rennie, and Lawrence, today was prank day. You sure this is going to work? Sam spoke into his earpiece. He glanced at the cracked screen of his smartphone, which he concealed against the face of the library tablet. A bit late to be wearing that question, don't you think? Rennie replied over the channel in his mild Indian accent. Sam could hear the whir of the 3D printers in the background, confirming Rennie was in position on the other side of the library. My questions are never late, nor are they early. I ask them precisely when I mean to. Rennie groaned. That is the most forced Gandalf quote I have ever heard. No such thing, Sam replied. He glanced over his tablet at their unsuspecting target, Mrs. Blagham. The school principal, sorry, school librarian, <laughs> sat at her desk, her long, decorated fingernails prying open a Tupperware container of her usual egg salad. Sam fingered the glass vial in his pocket and took a deep breath. A good prank was an art form, a well-coordinated dance. One misstep and it could end in disaster. Okay, waiting on you, Hotshot, Rennie said. What are you talking about? Sam whispered, looking back down at his phone. I'm waiting on Lawrence. He still isn't in position. He's been there for like a minute, dude. Sam tapped his phone, but the tracking app with Lawrence's location didn't respond. His stomach dropped. Piece of junk. Phone's frozen again. If this prank goes up in smoke because of this outdated, busted up phone. Hey, Sam. Rennie's voice cut through. What? Lawrence hissed back. Lawrence is headed your way. I think we've been compromised. What do you mean headed my way? Sam said, looking over his shoulder. He's supposed to be distracting Blagham over by the touchscreen tables. Panic backhanded him across the face like a WWE wrestler. There was Lawrence, standing beside the vice principal, sheepishly pointing in Sam's direction. I'll poop. Sam's mom stared forward as she drove. She wore a navy-colored company polo shirt and still smelled strongly of massage oils. It didn't take Sherlock Holmes to see that she'd left in the middle of a job. Waiting for her to start talking was always torture. 
Sam called it the eye of the hurricane. The chaos of getting caught was behind him. The punishment was still to come. But for now, he could only suffer in the unnerving silence. The eye was the worst. Before you do these things, do you ever stop to consider the harmful effects of your decisions? Sam's mom finally spoke, her jaw tense. I guess I'm just an eternal optimist, Mom. Sam's mom flipped the car into self-drive and slowly turned in his direction with that intense look reserved only for irate mothers and grumpy cat memes. She looked fit to throttle Sam, which was particularly terrifying since her job as a massage therapist gave her the grip strength of Thor. Is this part of your joke too? Having your mother leave work early? Miss out on clients? This is funny to you? Dad liked my pranks, Sam mumbled. Sam's mother drew in a sharp breath and paused. What your father liked was for you and me to be happy. Do I look happy to you right now? You need to think beyond the punchline of your pranks, mister. You need to think about what effect you have on the people who have to clean up your messes. I technically didn't even do anything. The vice principal just has it out for me. He way overreacted. I would agree if this hadn't been the fourth time this year. Somehow, I doubt that the vomit powder you had in your pocket was for Mrs. Blagham's benefit. Sam's mom ran her hands through her hair. I need you to stop, Sam. Sam sighed and looked at his shoes. He hated seeing that exasperated look on his mom's face. These things had always been easier with his dad. He didn't feel like he had to apologize to his father, let alone lay it on extra thick to speed along the scolding. It was like his dad just understood. For the last two years, Sam had been missing more than just a parent. He had been missing his greatest ally. Sorry, Mom, Sam said looking out the window. I want you to show me you're sorry, not just tell me. Understand? Sam nodded. The car rounded the corner and slowed automatically as they entered Sam's neighborhood. Modest, one-story houses flanked the road, separated by low, chain-link fences. Their street, usually teeming with activity, was still. He'd lived on Centennial Drive his entire life, but whenever he got home, sent home early, he couldn't help the weird feeling that, although this was his home, he only belonged here at certain hours of the day, and any deviation from that schedule was out of place. And Sam? Yeah, Mom? His mom reached back for her purse and removed a small rectangular box, tossing it on Sam's lap. Happy birthday. Sam, Rinnie, and Lawrence sat in Sam's basement on a worn-out leather couch, chowing down on bowls of vanilla ice cream and warm chocolate brownies. While getting sent home early from school usually didn't end in a party, all punishments for the boys had mercifully been put on hold in honor of Sam's birthday. So, what's the surprise? Lawrence asked, stuffing his face with a fork full of brownie. You guys ready for this? Sam said barely able to contain his excitement. He reached into his pocket and withdrew a brand new phone. No way, the zip top capalo? Rinny said, eyes wide in amazement. There was a hint of jealousy in Rinny's voice, making the moment all the sweeter for Sam. Rinny's dad was a software company executive, which made it almost impossible to get something cool before he did. Almost. Yes way, Sam replied, brandishing his gift. When it came to phones and tablets, the Zip Talk Apollo was in a class all of its own. Shatterproof, shockproof, waterproof, and solar powered. It was closer to a tri-order from Star Trek than it was to a phone. It could be used for anything from playing games while on the toilet to conducting ultrasounds on pregnant women in remote, impoverished countries. 
There was even one viral video where a guy claimed it could be used as a low-grade body armor and shot one with a 22 rifle to prove it. It could have been fake, but it seemed legit. The add-ons, apps, compatible devices, and features offered near endless possibilities. Which voice assistant are you going to choose? Rennie asked, craning his head to get a better view of the phone. Sam went into the settings and started scrolling through the hundreds of preloaded voice assistant personalities. There was everything from Iron Man's Jarvis to Cortana from the Halo games. Rumor was that the Apollo's voice assistants had borderline artificial intelligence and would evolve their behavior over time based on your questions, location, search history, pictures, and videos. Sam didn't know whether to be geeked out or freaked out. There are just too many awesome ones to choose from, Sam said. Just choose one, man, Rennie pressed. Sam shrugged, flicked his finger across the screen, and tapped on a name at random. Heinrich Schneider? Sam paused. Who in the fart is Heinrich Schneider? Rennie shrugged, but Lawrence nodded emphatically before speaking. Neither of you guys heard of Hein, the mastermind detective? He's like the most popular character in German TV from 2020 to 2027. Wow, Rennie said. I think we have a new front runner for worthless and obscure information that Lawrence knows. And that's saying something. Sam selected a voice assistant and quickly read the instructions. Yo, Heinrich, this is Sam Shelton, master of this phone. Recognize my voice. Guten Tag, Sam Shelton, his phone replied in a robotic German accent. Would you like me to reveal the many features of your new phone? I'm good for now, but maybe later. You know where to find me, Heinrich replied. I've got to hold it. Can I hold it? Lawrence asked, his expression like a puppy's begging for a treat. Lawrence, Sam said, raising an eyebrow. Uh, yeah? You seen that video where the guy runs over one of these with a monster truck and it doesn't put a scratch on it? Yes? Lawrence drew out the word. I still don't feel safe handing you my phone. Consider it punishment for botching the prank today. Sam leaned over and slugged Lawrence in the arm. Oh, come on! Lawrence flinched backward and rubbed his shoulder while Rennie laughed at the familiar scene. Shorter than most, rounder than most, and more awkward than most, Lawrence's only real talents were knowing worthless trivia and finding himself at the butt of every joke and the ownership of every mishap. If Sam was honest, however, it wasn't Lawrence's chronic misfortune that made Sam reluctant to hand over his Apollo. Even though the phone was essentially bulletproof, Sam felt uneasy trusting anybody with his present. Not only was it the most expensive thing he had ever owned, but he had no idea how his mom had ponied up the cash to get it in the first place. It was almost too nice of a gift, but maybe that was the point, like getting an unsolicited favor from some slick-haired mobster. Sam was unwittingly in his mother's debt. Sam's mom, mob boss of the guilt mafia. So, my friend... Rennie said, greedily rubbing his hands together. Have you tried the projector or the language translator? Did you get the hologram generator add-on? Tell me you got the hologram generator add-on. Well there, Rennie! Sam laughed. Life was just one big computer game to Rennie. Literally at times. By the end of last summer, he managed to crack the world leaderboard in the battle strategy game Warcraft of Empires. Most parents would be furious. His actually took him out to celebrate. Let me send a text from this thing before I jump into night vision, ultrasonics, and taser functions, would you? Wait, it has a taser function? Lawrence asked, looking from Sam to Rennie. Sam and Rennie both looked at Lawrence with flat, twin expressions. No, they said in unison. Sam, Rennie said, taking another bite of brownie and gesturing with his fork. We need to take this bad boy for a spin. See what they can do. 
what you have in mind. Let's do what we've always wanted to do, Brinny said, grinning ear to ear. Eat a half gallon of ice cream using only Oreos for spoons? Lawrence asked. No, Brinny rolled his eyes. I'm talking about hitting the vice principal's house. Sam drew in a breath. It was the ultimate mark the lair of their arch nemesis. They tossed around the idea of a possibility for more than a year now, like one would toss around the possibility of asking Tandy Myers to dance, or the possibility of taking Rennie's dad's Porsche for a jewelry ride. The prospect sounded epic, but when it came down to it, no one had the guts. Man, Sam said, shifting in his seat. I don't know. What's this? Rennie said in mock surprise. The infamous Sandwise Sheldon is backing down from an adventure? Sam hated it when people used his first full name, or at least when they were using it to mock him. It was an absurd name. Sam would readily admit that, but he was proud of his geek heritage. Sam's grandparents actually didn't know a hobbit hole from a wormhole, but Sam's father was a child of the late 90s, And when Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy came out, his life was changed forever. At least Sam's dad has exercised some restraint when it came to naming his son. Sam could have ended up as a Frodo or Bilbo or Gandalf. Sam probably had his mom to thank for that. Despite getting teased sometimes, he was proud to have his name. Being a fantasy geek was something that he could always share with his dad, something that he could remember him by. Sam, Rennie, and Lawrence, the geek, the nerd, and the dork. So, what'll it be, Mr. Shelton? Rennie coaxed. Dude, we're all on probation, Sam stressed. My mom would kill me. Your parents would kill you. Lawrence's parents would be glad he got exercise. Hey! Sorry, Sam chuckled. Look, Rennie, you think my mom's going to let me keep my phone if she finds out I used it to pull a prank on the vice principal? Like, four hours after she gave it to me? I'd like to hang on to this thing for more than one evening, thank you very much. I brought my gear, Rennie said enticingly. How much of it? All of it. Rennie flashed a confident grin. Sam paused, contemplating. Probation's overrated, he finally said as he shoved the last of his brownie into his mouth, pocketed his phone, and headed for the door. It was late evening. Sam crouched behind a well-manicured shrub and sifted through Rennie's black tactical backpack. It was like instantly leveling up a character in a video game and gaining access to all the unlockables. Earpieces, nano cameras, listening devices, long-range voice recorders, and more. He had to physically restrain himself from giggling with joy. The bag had a ridiculous amount of pockets and compartments, and not a single one went unused. The thing must have weighed 50 pounds. Sam reached into the side pocket and fished out a hard case that contained his favorite bit of gear, a pair of angular heads-up display goggles that the boys called the HUD specs. He snuck a peek through the shrubs at the vice principal's house. Only a few outside lights were on. A faint light flickered through one of the ground floor windows, the telltale sign of someone watching TV. Sam turned back around and readied the final bits of the gear he needed for the night. A mini drone with quick release latch, a piece of string with a small pouch, and an egg. He donned the HUD specs and synced them to his phone with a tap of the screen. Numbers and letters popped up in the corners of Sam's field of vision, telling him everything from his heartbeat to the exact position of their trio. Sam felt like Iron Man. Sam tapped his phone again, and his earpiece went live. Come in, gold leader. Mondungus, this is Gardner. Gardner, this is gold leader. Rennie's voice pattern scribbled across the corner of Sam's HUD. Mondungus, Lawrence's voice came over the channel. 
Why do I have to be Mundungus? Sorry, man. I already programmed it into my phone. You almost ready with that camera? Give me a second, Lawrence grumbled, obviously not thrilled with Sam's choice of call sign. Try it now. Sam looked at his phone and saw a new device icon appear. He pressed the image, and a video feed popped into view on his HUD, showing the dimly lit solar-powered battery bank on the side of the vice principal's house. Sweet. A moment later, Rinny came into the picture, sneaking up to the battery bank as if it were a sleeping pit bull. With smooth, practiced movements, Rinny reached around the back of the battery bank and disconnected the main power feed to the house. All the lights went out. Sam touched his goggles, and his darkened surroundings came to life, bathed in the fluorescent green lines of night vision. He turned on the drone, and with a mechanical whir, the mini quadcopter took to the sky, its egg cargo dangling a foot below. With the drone's video feed patched into the HUD specs, Sam expertly maneuvered the drone into position, some 50 feet above the house's battery. He panned the camera down to look directly beneath the quadcopter. He'd only have one shot at this. The back door burst open, and Sam jumped at the noise, almost dropping his phone. He peered through the bushes to see the vice principal, dressed in his pajamas, stalk towards the side of the house with his cell phone flashlight held out in front of him. Target coming into position, Rennie whispered. Target acquired, Sam replied. Camera rolling, Lawrence added. Gardna, Rennie said, release the package at will. Sam eyed the feed from the drone and saw the vice principal come into position at the battery. This was it. No turning back now. With a tap on his phone, Sam watched the egg fall away into the darkness towards its unwitting target. Before it landed, a miracle happened. The kind of miracle that reaffirms one's faith in the prank gods. The vice principal looked up. With a splat and a string of curses, the vice principal wiped frantically at his face. He looked down at his egg-coated hands and froze, his rage approaching critical mass. You rotten, pestering little twerps! The vice principal bellowed into the night. I know you're here somewhere! Uh-oh. Sam enabled the auto-return on his drone and began packing up his gear. Guys, Lawrence whispered sharply. He's headed right for me. I think he sees me. Mandungus, do not move, Rennie commanded. He can't see you. Just stay put. What should I do? Lawrence's voice grew more panicked. I just told you what to do, Rennie whispered. Stay put. I'm going to make a break for it. Mother Hubbard. Sam cursed as he saw Lawrence's GPS marker start to move in his direction. Before Sam could run, he heard a deep rumble like the approaching of a far-off thunderstorm. Sam looked to the sky for signs of lightning, but saw nothing. Then, the ground began to shake. Windows and streetlights rattled as the shaking intensified. Car alarms set off on a street-long firework, blaring into the night air. Sam rocked back and forth as if he were standing on a paddleboard in the middle of a lake, before falling to his hands and knees. Holy boogers! Sam yelled into his calm. It's an earthquake! What do I do? screamed Lawrence. Sam could hear his friend's voice from across the yard, even without his earpiece. I'm scared, guys! What do I do? Just get on the ground, man! Rennie called out. Sam didn't have much of a choice. He curled into a ball and threw his hands over his head. As the rumbling grew louder... An odd sensation washed over him. It was an explosion of chills that started in his gut and radiated it through his organs, muscles, and skin before reversing its course and flowing back into his core. The wave of chills overtook him again, pulsing outward like an army of a thousand frozen ants escaping from his stomach, only to return a moment later. Um, guys, Sam said, I feel funny. Yeah, it's a farting earthquake. Rennie's voice was hardly audible over the din of the quake. 
the weird sensation repeated again and again, quickening with each successive flow. Sam curled in tighter, clutching at his chest. Something was seriously wrong, and it wasn't just the earthquake. His vision faded to black. He tore off his goggles, but still saw nothing. Voices came in over his earpiece, but he couldn't make them out. His heart hammered. His breathing quickened. He didn't feel the shaking anymore. The last thing he remembered was wondering if the earthquake had suddenly stopped. Sam didn't like the taste of dirt. Not that he knew anyone who actually did. Tasting dirt was a sign that something hadn't gone according to plan. You dropped your food on the ground, you tripped and face planted, or some bully was rubbing your face in the grass. Sam couldn't recall if any of those applied to his current situation. He just knew that something hadn't gone according to plan, because there he was, tasting dirt. He turned his head and spit several times before opening his eyes. It was daytime. He was lying on the ground, ground that wasn't moving. He sat up slowly and looked around. A snow-topped mountain range surrounded him on three sides, with a forest's edge not far away on his left. The air was crisp and fresh and reminded him of the time he spent with the scouts at Glacier National Park. The scenery was as breathtaking as it was puzzling, since the last thing he remembered was being outside his vice principal's house in Bozeman at night trying to ride out an earthquake. He heard voices and turned around to see two figures, some ten yards away, rooting through Rinny's black tackle backpack. A pair of brown and white horses stood off to the side. Hey! Sam yelled out reflexively, coming to his feet. What do you think you're doing? The two men turned in Sam's direction, and he immediately wished he was back face down tasting dirt, although something told him he might get his wish. The men looked like a pair of Renaissance Festival peasants, if the peasants had lost their way in the forest for about three months. They flashed humorless smiles with a combined number of teeth that fell well short of a single complete set. Sam's stomach twisted and he hoped to heavens these guys were just really dedicated cosplayers. Um, scratch that, Sam relented. Carry on with the, um, rummaging. I'll just be on my way. Be on your way, one of the men mocked, in what Sam figured was a British accent. The man's voice was squeaky and discordant, as if someone had just strangled a dog toy. Sam suppressed a gasp at the stranger's appearance. One of the man's eyes was bright yellow with a small vertical pupil as if he'd stolen the thing from a house cat. Sam thought it might be a trick contact lens, but aside from the wrong color, the eye was the wrong size. You can't be leaving already. We've been waiting for you to wake up this whole time, my friend. Haven't had a chance to properly introduce ourselves. You see, I'm Reynold, and my companion here is Gern. Sam had never felt so anxious in his entire life, not when Sheriff Terrell caught him putting a dry ice bomb in the Pineview Park drop toilet, not when he forgot his only line in Mopsy in the school play of Peter Rabbit, not even when he mixed up his Valentine's cards in fourth grade and mistakenly confessed his love to Cammy Robertson. Devastating as they were, None of them carried the underlying threat of mortal danger. This was different. Sam didn't know where he was, who these men were, or what they wanted. All he knew was that they were looking at him like a mountain lion eyes a stray fawn. Despite his best efforts to stay calm, he felt his legs start to tremble. Don't be shy, boyo, Gern said his voice like the deep croak of a bullfrog. Just want you to explain these curiosities in your bag here, friend. It just hold on a second there, Sam said, hands raised and slowly backpedaling towards the tree line. If he needed to make a break for it, the nearby woods would be his best chance of escape. If this is some kind of prank for getting the vice principal with that egg, 
I give up. I'll even turn over the video files. They're saved on the drone. I just stream them to my specs. I seriously don't care. You got me. Fair and square. What's he going on about? Gurn turned to his partner, confused. I'd say he's stalling. Reynolds smiled as the two men inched forward, matching Sam's slow retreat. So, what's this thing do? Gurn said, shaking the flashlight experimentally. Sam stopped and cocked an eyebrow. He looked around, half expecting his friends to pop out from behind cover with cameras live streaming. Seriously? Don't you get smart with us, boy, Reynolds said, squinting his cat eye and jabbing a short club in Sam's direction. <laughs> Sam hadn't seen Reynolds pull the club. He swallowed hard, as confused now as he was terrified. It's a flashlight, guys. It's a what? Gurn croaked, his fat face scrunched. Oh, come on, Sam said, his anxiety fading at the absurdity. You guys are putting me on. Rennie? Lawrence? I don't know where you got these two jokers, but you got your money's worth. Jokers? Reynolds squawked. His darkened expression brought back every ounce of Sam's fear. You want to see a joke, you little twit? Reynolds nodded at Gurn, who started walking quickly towards Sam. Sam bolted towards the trees, not daring to turn around, not knowing if at any moment he would be seized from behind. He hadn't gone ten steps before he tripped and fell onto his face. Before he could stand back up, he felt a strong hand grab him by the arm and yank him to his feet. Where you off to in such a hurry, boy -o? Gurn said, breathing heavily. Sam almost gagged at the rot on the man's breath. He looked down to see Gurn's wooden hand locked around his arm like a vice. Sam panicked. He tried to pull away, but Gurn's grip was unshakable. He had to do something. He had to get away. He didn't know what to do. And then he felt it. A cold tingling where Gurn's wooden hand grabbed his arm. It was similar to the sensation he felt before he passed out, if not to a much lesser degree. Was it happening again? He didn't like how it felt and instinctively tried to suppress the sensation. What he did, Gurn screamed and fell backwards. Sam looked down at his arm and saw the bandit's disembodied wooden hand still holding on like the world's most morbid armband. He looked at Gurn, who sat up and stared dumbly at his own right arm, which now ended in a smooth, handless stump. This has got to be a dream, Sam whispered to himself, but it didn't feel like a dream. To his mind, yes, but to his senses, no. What in Mother Earth happened here? Renard asked as he finally caught up to his partner. Gang, your blazing hand's gone! I know me blazing hand's gone, Gurn wailed as he scrambled away from Sam. Little whelp must be some kind of drainer or something. Reynolds' cat eye went wide as he stared from his partner to Sam. Ah, uh, that's right, I'm a drainer! Sam held out his palm as threateningly as he could. Sam had no idea what just happened, but he decided to roll with it. I'll drain you too if you get any closer. Gurn scrambled to his feet to stand next to Reynold. The two thugs looked several steps backwards before stopping, their eyes darting to the ground. Sam stole a quick glance and finally noticed what he tripped on. A black knapsack laying in the dirt not a yard in front of him. Reynolds started forward, but Gurn grabbed him with his one remaining hand. It ain't worth it, mate. You just got that eye. Don't want to lose it to me hand. Leave the knapsack be. Don't know what you are, kid. Reynolds squinted his contrasting eyes and jabbed a finger in Sam's direction. But I know some folks who'd be interested to find out. Next time you see us, we'll take your hand as payment. 
Mock my words, you little whelp. Reynold glared at Sam a moment longer before Gurn pulled him away. Sam stood, dumbfounded, as he watched the thugs mount their horses and make their way down the trail. Sam bent over, hands on his knees, and took slow, deep breaths. It was all he could do not to faint. He reached over and tried to pry the wooden hand off his arm, but it wouldn't budge. Several minutes passed before he could stop from shaking. At least they're gone. With Rennie's friggin' backpack! Hey, get back here! Sam yelled before thinking better of it. Losing the pack was a small price to pay for escaping with his life. Although, there was a good chance that Rennie would murder him when he found out the pack was stolen. Catch-22. There was at least 40 grand worth of gear in the pack, and Sam was a good friend to Rennie, but not 40 grand good. Sam's wallet was also in that pack, although the joke was on the thieves with that one. Seven bucks, a school idea, and an Arby's coupon wasn't much of a steal. Sam patted himself down to see if Reynold and Gurn hadn't picked him completely clean while he was cold. He checked his jacket and breathed a sigh of relief when he found his phone still in his inside pocket. Sam reached up and plucked out his earpiece. They hadn't taken that either, although he doubted those buffoons would have even noticed. Didn't appear broken, but it definitely didn't have any signal to Rennie or Lawrence. Sam stashed it in his jacket for safekeeping. He bent down and picked up the knapsack that the thugs had left behind. Turnabout being fair play and all, he opened it up and rummaged through its contents. A knife, some old ratty clothes, a few copper coins he didn't recognize, and a length of rope. Not exactly a stellar trade-off for $40,000 worth of tech. Sam stopped and looked around again at the surrounding mountains. Where in Merlin's beard am I? Other questions flooded his mind as he stared blankly in the countryside. What's a drainer? Did that guy really have a cat's eye? Where's the nearest Chick-fil-A? He was starving. Lucky for Sam, most of life's questions could be answered with his phone. All a man needed was his phone. Well, that and free Wi-Fi. <laughs> All right, guys, I can tell you're getting tired. <laughs> All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining me today. I will continue the book tomorrow. There you go. And uh, I will see you tomorrow at 2.45 with story time with Auntie and Molly. Talk to you tomorrow.